to kick off everything, I, I, I was telling you that I, I grew up in Kentucky. Thank you very much. Just to get your attention. So I, I went to this school in downtown Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, it, was, it was an old school, and we didn't have, we didn't have like, a place to play at all. And it was very sad. But we didn't have like, a, a nice grassy area to play. We didn't have a playground or anything. All we had was this big parking lot. And because we had this big parking lot, uh, you know, we would play kickball and, and some other things. But every once in a while, we just kind of got bored of those games. So we started making up games. And you know how it is. Like, I'm probably like 11, 10 or 11, you know, uh, at the time. You know, when you get a group of guys together, like exponentially the mental power of thought decreases, you know. The more, the, the more guys you add, the worse the idea becomes. And so we had like 10 of us get together and it was like, hey, let's make up this game. Yeah, that sounds awesome. You know, and to us, it was brilliant. To everybody else, it was probably the stupidest thing in the entire world. And so we made up this game uh, where we linked arms. Like we, we would like put our arms around each other and we would stand broad, you know, sideways. And we would walk around the parking lot going, we never stop. We never stop. We never stop. You see, exponentially crashing at this moment mentally. So, and we didn't. We didn't stop. You know, some, you know, little second graders just standing there picking his nose. We never stop. <laughs> Rolled over him. You know, girls are sitting in the parking lot braiding their hair. <laughs> We never stop. <laughs> Rolled over them. We even had some kids that were brave. You know, they wanted to try to stop us. You know, and they're like, we never stop. <laughs> We'd roll over those guys. And we didn't. We never stopped. But anyway, the reason why I bring that up, the reason why I bring up that story is because um, the Lord is not going to stop. Amen? Philippians 1.6 says that, the Lord will, will complete what he has started in you. That's basically what it says, that the Lord will complete what he has started in you. He will, he will complete to perfection the good work that he has begun, which means that this isn't, this isn't over, amen? I know it seems like, okay, well, now we're getting ready to kind of, to getting ready to go home, and we got to prepare for that. And, and there's a reality to that, right? We've experienced something amazing this weekend, hopefully. Hopefully you've, you've been transformed in some way. Um, it, it's similar to uh, when Peter, James, and John were invited by Jesus up to the mountain. And while they were there, Jesus was transfigured in front of them, which means in that moment, they got to see his divinity, right? They got, to, they got a glimpse of, who, of, of, of his divinity and and in some ways, it obviously it it's, it frightened them. And Peter, because you know Peter always has to say something. You know that's what's so great about him. It's like it doesn't matter what, if it's good or bad. Peter's always like, I feel like I should say something at this moment. And so he does. And so Jesus is transfigured, and 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 Peter goes, uh, Lord, it is good that we are here. No kidding, <laughs> you know? Yes, it is good. And then Peter's like, we should build three tents. As if, say, it is good that we are here. This is an amazing thing that has happened. Let's set up some permanency here, and let's, let's establish this place as a holy place. And I'm sure right now that you guys this entire weekend have experienced something that you're like, man, I wish this could continue. I wish maybe, maybe some of you, are thinking, I wish, I wish we could stay here in this place, like physically stay here. But in the same way that Jesus did not stay up on the mountain, he didn't condone what Peter said. He didn't say, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. The voice of God said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The father is not done with you yet. But it means that he's not done with you yet. But it doesn't mean that you stay here. 
It means that we are about to walk off of this mountain, of this experience. And I don't say that to depress you. I say that to prepare you. It's important that we remember what we have experienced here this weekend. You know, I was last night I was listening to that to the song Waymaker, you know, and we get to that part of the bridge and it's like, even when I don't feel it working, even when I don't see it you're working. Stop. Stop. Yes. And I was like, that is that is beautiful. And it's quite possible when you go down from this mountain, that you might not feel it. You might not see it. But even when we don't feel it, even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel God, even when we don't see God, God, we need to have that faith that God is still working. Amen? It's not going to be easy, y'all. Do me a favor. I'm going to give you a couple choices, and I want you to point, and I realize that if you're on this side, you're going to have to kind of do this, and if you're on this side, you may have to do this, but I'm going to have you, I'm going to give you a couple choices I'm going to have between a, a this or a that. I'm going to say, would you rather a this, and if you would rather the this, you point this way, and if you'd rather the that, you point that way, okay? So pretty simple. Um, would you rather eat carrots or broccoli? Someone's championing broccoli. Yeah. Okay, great. Would you rather? Would you rather go to the dentist or the doctor? <clears throat> Some people were already like pointing the opposite direction before I even gave them the other choice. <laughs> would you rather be completely bald or hairy all over? So, some, guy, some guys are like, I'm already halfway there. I'm, I'm good. I'll just be bald. <laughs> oh, man. Yes. Would you rather bring about lasting world peace or end hunger? Ooh. Yeah. Threw it, threw it down deep. Threw it down deep there. <clears throat> All right, so fun little activity that talks about choice. And you know what? When we go back down from this place, when we go back to your homes, you go back to your schools, you go back to your parishes, there's going to be choice. And, and the choices, and you've, you've heard them kind of laid out before you all weekend long, that you're going to have choice between the good, the bad, the truth, the lie, fearlessness. Or fear. And trust me, when I say that when you go back, sometimes those decisions, like up here, it's easy to sometimes make those decisions. Yes, I will be fearless. Fearless, fearless. Like we, we champion that song. But then when we're faced with things back home, we might be like, Fear, oh, fear. <laughs> and I, again, I don't, I don't tell you this to depress you. I don't tell you this to, 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 um, to be like a damper on this final moment of being here. But I do want to prepare you because the devil hates that you guys have been here. He hates any transformation that has gone on in your life this weekend. And he hates the idea of your zealousness, of your excitement, of your desire to share what you have brought, what you've gained here this weekend, and bring it back. And you know what? Get ready. There's going to be a battle. And you're like, I didn't sign up for that. Well, I'm sorry. We had it in the fine print on the registration form. It said, get ready for the battle of your life. Be ready. 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober and vigilant for the, the, 
the your opponent, the devil, is waiting around like a roaring, a prowling lion, uh, waiting to devour. Be sober and vigilant, which means be ready, be prepared. There's nothing to fear in the battle. You just have to know that there's going to be a battle. That's the most important thing. You can't go back and go, man, that was awesome, and let your guard down. Because right now, more than anything, you have, you have increased the threat to, to the devil's plan, and you are more on God's side, so you're, you're fortified. But you, you better believe that he's going to try to drag you back down. You better believe that the devil's going to try to drag you back down, so, so just be ready. Don't get caught off guard. Don't be surprised. And don't be afraid. When Jesus commissioned Peter, when Jesus finally, you know, initially told Peter, hey, uh, I'm going to make you, I'm going to give you the keys to the church and the gates of the netherworld will not prevail. Like, we can have confidence in that, amen? We can have confidence in the fact that Jesus said, hey, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld will not prevail over it. So, so we can go into the world with that confidence. We can go back to our homes with that confidence that, that no matter what happens in your life, no matter what, what valleys you might find yourself in, what battles, what struggles, what trials you might find yourself in, just know that the gates of the netherworld will not prevail against this church. And so the way that we stay strong, the way that we stay sober, the way that we stay vigilant is to stay connected to the church. And I know that some of you have been like, look, I, I, the, the church, I don't, I don't really understand the church. The church is there to help us, to fortify. Some of you have been maybe even wounded by, by people in the church and Hopefully there has been some reconciliation here this weekend where you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back involved. But, but let, us, let us not look at just this church or this time, but let us look at the, entire, the entirety of the church over the history of its existence. Hebrews 12.1. I'm going to get there. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us and persevere in running the race that lies before us. Because of this great cloud of witnesses, not just this cloud of witnesses that are here, yes, let us be reminded of that, but at the same time, let us go back through the history of our church and because of that great cloud of witnesses, let us go back to the beginning of the church whenever, whenever the church had its, had its beginnings. And let us be inspired by the work and by the efforts of that, those early evangelists who went around proclaiming Jesus, who went around proclaiming the gospel, who went around proclaiming the kingdom of God. And then think about all through time that not only people who have continued to proclaim the faith, but have even died for the faith. If you're doubting whether or not, you know, if you're doubting in any way the church, if you're doubting in any way, like, all these things that we believe, I mean, all you have to do, honestly, is just reflect on the martyrs for just a little bit. Like, anytime I get to that place, like, where the devil's just trying to, trying to twitch me a little bit, man, I just go to the martyrs because I just remember that, Men and women have died for this faith. They have been faced with either denounce the faith or you're going to die. And they chose death over denouncing the faith. Like, if that's, not, if that's not enough of a witness for us, I don't know what is. And how did they do that? How did they, how did they you know, go through life? Well, I mean, 
and, 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 and make those decisions. You know, what, the other thing that I want to tell you about is that um, in, when, uh, when Paul, let me see if I can get the second Corinthians here real quick. There it is. So when Paul first started out, like he is, he's out, you know, if you think, oh, man, it's going to be so hard when I get back home. You don't even understand, Cooper, all the trials and all the, all the heartache and all the struggle that I'm going to be dealing with when I go back and I start to try to proclaim my faith to, to, my, to my friends and to my family. Let me, let me, just, set, let me just settle your, your, your fears a little bit. This is Paul. Talking about all the hardships and all the struggles that he dealt with. Five times at the hands of the Jews, I received 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I passed a night and a day on the deep, which means that he was just floating around in the ocean. On frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own race, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, through hunger and thirst, through frequent fastings, through cold and exposure. And if that was not enough, right? He says, oh, and apart from these things, there's the daily pressure upon me of my anxiety for all the churches. Like, I would have quit at five times at the hands of the Jews. I had 40 lashes minus one. You know, I'm just... You think it's going to be hard for you? If you need some reinforcement and some encouragement, just go back to 2 Corinthians and read through this litany and go, okay, man, at the beginning, I mean, and, and think about that there wasn't a tremendous amount of witnesses, right? There was not this big, great cloud of witnesses at the time. I mean, these guys were pretty much on their own. And so if that doesn't convict us even more of all the hardships that Paul dealt with, and he kept going. Like that should tell us something. So what was it that moved him? Well, it was the power of the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus in, in, in John, John chapter 14 says, I have told you this while I'm with you, the, the advocate, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name. He will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. And they're like, you know, this is, this is while Jesus is with him. He's like, okay, is he going to send this Holy Spirit? They didn't really know what that was. And then in Acts, they're hiding out in the, in the upper room. They're scared. And all of a sudden, like a mighty rushing wind, the Holy Spirit fills the room. Tongues of fire land on top of the apostles' heads. And in that moment, they bust out of that place and begin to preach and begin to teach. And immediately, like we go from there, Chris talked about it just a few minutes before I got up. And then we hear that great scripture verse from Acts 2.42, that they committed themselves to the prayers, to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread. And it was the Holy Spirit welling up within them that gave them that, that encouragement, that gave them that power, that gave them that strength to endure the hardships that I just read about Paul. The Holy Spirit welling within them. And it's the same Holy Spirit that is within you. We don't have to be in a room and receive like this massive, you know, gale force wind blowing through us for us to be convinced when you were baptized, you received the Holy Spirit. If you are confirmed, you've received an outpouring of the Spirit within you. It is within you, and now what you need to do is cooperate with that Spirit. It's all about the cooperation. It's not going to be something that's just going to happen. So what are, what are the things that, that we need to cooperate with and, and move towards? Well, first of all, I, 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 there's three things that I'd like to, to, to point out to you. One is prayer. We can't say it enough. And if you don't know how to pray, you pray to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy, it says in Scripture that we do not know how to pray as we ought, so the Holy Spirit will help us in our weakness. And so let us pray to the Holy Spirit so that we know how to pray. But even if then, like, 
if you need something, get a, get, get a book. Like, I use this. I don't even know, I don't even know if you can get this. It's just a Catholic prayer book. Um, there's, a, there's an app, My Catholic Life. There's all kinds of apps, but, but, but I would commit yourself to morning prayer. And I don't mean just, you know, just getting up and saying a quick Hail Mary. That's great. But I mean committed, sit down. And, and most specifically, I would encourage you, if you're not already doing this, pray the morning offering. Not a morning offering, the morning offering. Oh, Jesus, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I, I, I offer you my prayers, works, joys, and sufferings of this day, along with the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and on and on. When you pray that at the beginning of the day, no matter what you experience, you have brought everything in and said, Jesus, it is yours, no matter what I encounter. And in the end of the night, do night prayers. Every night with my family, at minimum, we sit down and we do a meditation on the precious blood of Jesus. And then we pray at, at minimum, three Hail Marys. When we feel like it's not going to, and, and then when we, when we can, we, we pray a rosary every night. If you don't have a rosary, get one. Carry it with you. Let it be something that you can just, just pull out of your pocket. Don't be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got one, and it's, it hangs on my wall in a nice little thing. That does no good there. Let it be with you. Bring it with you so that you can pray and you can be reminded all day long of your need for prayer. Amen? Secondly, read Scripture. St. Jerome says this. He says, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. The first time I heard that, that stung a little bit. And it might be stinging you a little bit because I didn't know scripture. When I heard that first, I was like, "Whoa, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't know enough scripture." So, so I don't want to be ignorant of Jesus. So I need to not be ignorant of, of, of. I don't want to be ignorant of Jesus. So I'm not going to be ignorant of scripture. Which is why, like, it's probably it's probably to the detriment. Like, I just I know I throw a lot of scripture verses at you guys. I'm just like all over the place because I just love it so much. Um, there's this great. Uh, moment in, in the call of Ezekiel as one of the prophets, right? And uh, his excuse, because don't we all come up with excuses for why we cannot serve God? You know, well, you know, I'm this, I'm not holy enough, I'm not this enough. And, and the prophets were no different. And so Ezekiel gets up there and he says, he goes, don't call me, I don't have the right words. And God's like, I will give you the words. I will give you the words. And so he rolls out this scroll in a vision to him. And he says, son of, son of man, he calls him son of man. He says, Ezekiel, eat this scroll. And he says he ate the scroll, and it was as sweet as honey on his lips. We need to consume Scripture to where it's to the point to where we know and we can just let it be a part of our life. And then finally, we got to get some accountability. we got to find people around us who want to go in that same direction. Scripture says, do not be yoked with people who are different from you. Yoke is a, a big wooden thing that would connect two oxen together to pull a plow. Do not be yoked with people who are different from you. So if you need to find a new group of friends, God will provide it. <laughs> but don't be yoked with people who are different from you. Be going in the same direction. Build one another up. Support one another. Jesus sent the apostles out and the disciples out in pairs, right? It wasn't like, hey, the, and when he sent the 72, it was 36 pairs. You need someone in your life who's going to walk with you daily. Find that person. So as we prepare to come off the mountain, my, my encouragement to you is to follow through. I don't know if you have any golfers out there. I've been watching the, the Open Championship British Open. It's been pretty amazing. You know, when these guys, when they get up there, you know, and they, like, if, if, they, short, if they short it a little bit, they, they stop the swing about right here if they come through it, then, then, then the ball is not going to, it's not going to, it's going to follow a path that, that they want it to. It's not going to go where they want it to. So they have to follow through. And so, if you, in order for you to go and to do 
And to respond to this call to go where God is leading you to, we, we, you've got to follow through. And so uh, I'll tell you a quick story. So I, I told you I grew up in a small town outside of Lexington, Kentucky. Basketball is king. I was at a small Catholic school. Um, and my seventh grade class had 27 students in it, the entire grade. When I moved, and, and then uh, midway through uh, my, my uh, between my seventh grade year and my eighth grade year, we ended up moving to Dallas. Um, and so the first time in my life, I was going to a public school where uh, the eighth grade class had 280 students in it. And, it, and it, was, it was extremely challenging. I wish I could say I was that cool kid from out of town, but I definitely was not. Um, I had a small group of friends, and all the cool guys, like they didn't want to have anything to do with me until basketball season rolled around. Because, see, I played basketball in Kentucky. I was pretty good. And now word's getting out that um, the new kid from Kentucky is going gonna, is gonna to try out for the basketball team. So I'm sitting in class one day, just minding my own business, you know. The dude behind me taps me on his shoulder. He's like, hey, dude. I'm like, yeah. And this is a guy that's normally too cool to talk to me. I'm like, yeah. He's, hey, man, I hear you trying out for the basketball team. Yeah? You're from Kentucky, right? Yeah? Well, don't steal my position, man. Okay. A couple of days later, I'm sitting in another class. Same thing happens again. I'm sitting there minding my own business. The dude next to me taps me on his shoulder. He's like, he goes, hey, dude. I'm like, yeah. Hey, dude, I hear you trying out for the basketball team. Yeah? You're from Kentucky, right? Yeah? Well, don't steal my position, man. Okay. So then I was like, what is going on? Like, what's, why is it, why, what's the big deal here? And then I realized, oh, I'm from Kentucky. Basketball is king there. This is a, this is a football state. I'm like, ha, they're intimidated. Coop, you know, so anyway. So, so then the next guy that comes up to me, he's like, hey, man, I hear you trying out for the basketball team. I got cocky. He's like, hey, man, I got trying out for the basketball team. I'm like, that's right. You're from Kentucky, right? You know it. Well, dude, don't steal my position. Be afraid. Be very afraid. So the day of tryouts rolls around, and I end up being the last person in the locker room. In fact, by the time I got to the locker room to get dressed at the end of the day, every single one of the other guys, they were gone, already in the gym. And I don't know if it's like this at your school, but the doors leading into the gym were like those, the solid doors with the little window, you know? And so before I walked in and put on a clinic, because that's what I was going to do, I'm walking down, you know, I, I, I stop, and I'm, I'm looking in the window to see what I'm going up against. And all this confidence that I had fell through the floor. Because these guys were a lot better than I had given them credit for. I mean, I was kind of hoping to see a bunch of Ophi football players. No offense if you're a football player, I don't believe this anymore. Um, but I wanted to see this. Basketball is fun. Let's shoot the ball. You know, that's what I wanted to see so I could go in there and pull off some, you know, some, you know, spider dribbles and stuff like that and be crazy. But I didn't see that, and so I, it, it, it not my confidence. So I sat down out there. I'm like sitting outside of the doors, and I'm like, come on, man. You can do this. I'm trying to pump myself up. You got this. You got this. You go. And so I stood back up, and then I started thinking about all the ways I, I stopped short again. I started thinking about all the ways that I was going to mess up, all the ways that I was going to fail, all the ways that I just wasn't going to be able to match up and compare. I wasn't going to compare well with these guys. So I sat back down again. And I did this a couple of times, and finally, when it was all said and done, I turned around, I went back to the locker room, I got dressed in the clothes that I wore to school that day, and I caught the bus home. Longest bus ride of my life. I didn't even give myself a chance. I didn't even walk through the door. I was defeated before I even walked through the doors. I defeated myself with my own internal struggle and my own internal comparison, and my own internal, like, I'm, I'm going to fail, so there's no point in even trying. And that would, be, that would be horrible for you to get to those doors there, to get to those doors there, or get to those bus doors and be like, you know what, it doesn't matter. Everything that we did up here, I mean, this is just like a moment in my life. I'm going to fail. I, I can't do everything that they said. We don't expect you to do everything, but we expect you to start. 
We want to encourage you through what we've said and our enthusiasm to encourage you to walk through those doors, to not leave your spiritual self sitting here in this place and go, hey, I'll pick you up next, next summer, see you later, and go back to your old way of life. Bust through those doors. The Lord who has begun a good work in you is not finished. And it's not a work that he wants to wait another 362 days from now to keep working on. He wants to start and continue working on you now. So let's follow through. Let's go through those doors and let's live a life emboldened by the Spirit, a life of fearlessness, a life of, of accountability with one another. And let's walk out those doors together and go and change the world. Amen.